Welcome everyone. Welcome to our Bible study here at Colonial Hill today. I uh, hope you have your Bibles handy and we'll open them to the second chapter of Acts. We're going to be looking at the focal verses, second chapter of Acts, verse 5 through 16 and then 36 through 38. The background covers the first 40 verses of that chapter. Next week, we'll be looking at um, the last verses of that chapter. There are only eight remaining after we cover these background verses. Hopefully, you have found your place there in your Bible. Now, let's open with prayer. Father, we invite you to be with us this morning. Guide our thoughts, guide our hearts. May we truly be in tune with you, Lord. May we see and learn new insights by the studying of your word, Lord. May we realize more fully the role of the Holy Spirit in convicting, converting, and motivating us to be what you would have us to be. Lord, May all that we think, say, and do here this morning be in accordance with your will, and may you receive all glory and honor and praise as a result of this study. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you especially for Christ our Savior, in whom and through whom and by whom we live, we move, and we have our being. Thank you for the salvation that is ours because of what you did, Lord Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, by way of introduction here today, uh, one of the sources that I am provided with, the uh, author of that source, talked about how his church puts on a big Christmas pageant every year. They go to a great deal of time, effort, and expense to do the pageant, to invite people from all across the community to provide treats as well as low-cost meals to those that attend. And he winds all of that up by asking a question. Why do churches that do these sorts of things, why do they do them? I'm sure you're like me. You know several churches that do this Christmas and or Easter pageants. Well, the, the answer to that question for those of us that were raised in the church is quite obvious. We are compelled to share the good news with anybody and everybody that will listen. And by putting on those pageants, we attract people that otherwise wouldn't come to our our church services to come to hear and some to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, in the, today's lesson, we're going to see the first event where believers had the opportunity to see, to experience the Holy Spirit on a large scale. Now, there's plenty of references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but they were always uh, individual or small scale, where starting with today's lesson, things changed. Jesus told the disciples that the reason he was going back to the Father was so that he could send the Spirit to minister to us, to convict us, and to be our guide and our guard as we go through this life. The, the experience we're talking about is normally just referred to as the Pentecostal experience. Well, now, Pentecost is one of the three major holidays, one of the three major celebrations of Judaism. Uh, of course, the Passover is one of those, and the uh, Festival of Lights which occurs around Christmas time. Hanukkah is another. And this one is one of the three. All devout Jews within so many miles of J Jerusalem were commanded to come to Jerusalem 
on these three major holidays. Uh, sometimes what we call Pentecost is also referred to as the Festival of Weeks because it occurs seven weeks after Passover. Fifty days, of course, seven days in a week, 49 days, so the next day would be the 50th and that would be Pentecost. It's also uh, quite often referred to as the Festival of First Fruits because what this did was it celebrated the first harvest. Uh, Israel being primarily a country where if there is a harvest, it's a grain harvest. And so the first grain harvest would take place this time of the year. And because it was the festival of first fruits, they, um, under Levitical law, were to give a tenth of the very first harvest that they brought in that went to the Lord as his portion of the harvest. Now, the uh, whole experience is going to be very, very exciting, but it's also going to be extremely important as this is going to initiate what Jesus commanded the disciples to do. He commanded them to take the good news to all the world and to teach all people everywhere about him. Well, this is the beginning of that process, and it begins with the Holy Spirit coming and filling the disciples. Now, they were told to stay in Jerusalem until the Spirit came. They did that. They were told in the background verses that the disciples were gathered in one place. Now, we're not told what that place is. There's a lot of... Uh, conjecture about where it was because what happens here it's believed that it had to be a, a, at the very least a large place possibly even in the court of the gentiles at the temple itself where solomon's uh, porch is found and uh, could have been there we really don't know but in any case it is an extremely, extremely important event for us Christians as we experience the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and as we see the dramatic change that takes place in people once they receive the Spirit, allow the Spirit to work in their lives. Luke describes three manifestations of the Spirit in the verses that we look at. Actually, we don't look at these. These are some of the background verses. First of all, he says there was a sound. There was a sound associated with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he likens it unto the sound of a violent, rushing wind, kind of like a windstorm. The second manifestation was tongues of fire that were seen and visibly uh, touching the disciples, others that were gathered there, other believers. And the third manifestation was the filling, F-I-L-L-I-N-G, the filling of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit came into the lives, into the hearts of these disciples and the others that were there with them. Each disciple was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. Now that word tongue can be translated more than one way. It has created some disagreement among interpreters over the years. In um, Acts chapter 2 verse 6, the Greek word for language, and we see Luke changing from a word that is translated tongues in the Greek to a word that is translated language is actually the word from which we get our English word dialect. Dialect. 
which of course a dialect is a regional language where you may have a major language within that language you could have several different dialects. Some argue that the disciples spoke in quote ecstatic utterances end quote ecstatic utterances. Uh, read more than one source that said that. I read others that strongly disagrees with that. If so, if they did speak in ecstatic utter utterances, as we read the verses here, you will see that those listening to them, those hearing what they were saying, evidently through the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't hear ecstatic ut utterances. The Holy Spirit translated those utterances into a an intelligible language that those people that were listening not only heard, but they understood, as we will point out here in a moment as we get into our focal verses. So uh, maybe they did speak in ecstatic utterances, but if so, it was at the command and the control of the Holy Spirit. The uh, Lord chose to do with what happens here something that has never been paralleled before or since in history. He allowed a powerful, powerful witness and a powerful conversion to take place as thousands are going to be transformed by what the Holy Spirit does through Primarily Peter, who's going to be the primary spokesman, but all of the disciples play a role in this, as you would see if you read all of the background verses. So, remember, there were Jews literally from all over most of the known world at that time, known at least in the Western Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, and the Western part of Europe. Asian, extreme Asian countries were not represented, but nearly all others were, as we'll see as we look at these first focal verses. So with that bit of an introduction, if you would now look at Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 13. 5 through 13. In the quarterly, the heading for this segment is uh, noticed. Noticed. We pick up with verse 5. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When the sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all of our own, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we heard them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? Verse 13, But some sneered and said, They're drunk on new wine. Wow, what, a, what an awesome experience. Verses 5 and 6, we see devout Jews from every nation. Technically, that's uh, not completely correct, but it points out that people had come from the nations that the people that were there knew about. And what a perfect time, what a perfect time to hear what they heard, to experience what they experienced, and for the good news of Jesus Christ to go forth rapidly to much of the known world at that time. It is generally agreed among scholars uh, 
that within 30 years, much of the known world will have heard about Jesus. And this is one of the main reasons, because of what happened here on the day of Pentecost. Now we read in the background material that they came together. We're not sure where this was happening. Some say it took place in the upper room where several other meetings had taken place. But others disagree and say it took place at Solomon's Colonnade with, within the grounds of the part of the temple that was devoted to the Gentiles. We really don't know. We're not told. Uh, Luke tells us about this. No one else does. And he doesn't go into the detail of where they were meeting. The important thing is they did meet, this did happen, and they did experience the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, which was going to completely transform them, as we see as we go through the verses here. Two words that we need to put some emphasis on, astounded and amazed. Now, a state of confusion existed because what was happening made no sense. As we saw there, these men are all Galileans. They all come from Galilee. Now, Galileans apparently had a very distinct dialect, a very distinct accent, uh, kind of like me. <laughs> I speak Texan. I have a very distinct accent, and I have been made aware of that numerous times as I've traveled around, and they too had that. But now, these people from other parts of the world are hearing them speak in their language, and not only their language, but their own dialects. And this is disturbing to these people. They're asking, how, how can this happen? How can this be? How can it possibly be that we hear these uneducated men, for the most part, and yet they're able to speak in our language and speak fluently as such. The uh, crowd expressed surprise at them being able to speak in their tongue and not speaking Aramaic, which probably was their first language, or could, could have been Greek. That Many of them did speak Greek. Probably was not their first language, but they could probably speak it fairly well. In any case, they weren't or whatever they were speaking, the people weren't hearing anything but their language and their dialect, and they understood it. In verse 7 and 8, we see that members of the crowd were hearing in their native language. And then in that those verses, Luke shifts from the word tongues to the word native language. Key, key thing here is language. Tongue could possibly be some of these uh, ecstatic utterances that we talked about earlier, but language would imply a written, understood language, and most, most, not all, Bible authorities think that's what happened. They were speaking in an intelligible language. Now, possibly... This was a miracle of hearing instead of a miracle of speaking. You probably heard that before. Whatever was being said, the listeners were hearing in their own language. So it's possible that what was taking place was the Holy Spirit was taking the language and translating it into something that the people understood. That is certainly possible. Now, whether it's probable or not, you'll have to decide for yourself. Now we look at the, the different groups that are named by Luke here. We see the Parthians, the Medes, and the Elamite, e Elamites. These are all people that resided in what is today Persia or Iran. These were people who had something in common, but not a whole lot. And remember, people were pretty well divided at that time because transportation and communication was not, not easy. 
Also, we see him talk about Mesopotamia. Well, Mesopotamia is a word that literally means, when translated into English, between the rivers. Between the rivers, and the rivers being the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so that covered much of modern-day Iraq. So we've got much of Iran and much of Iraq covered here. And we also see him refer to Judea. Well, of course, that's where they were, so that's not surprising that there were people from Judea there. But there were also people from Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. Now, all of those places are in modern-day Turkey. Turkey being a somewhat rugged, mountainous country, these different groups were somewhat isolated from each other, so they had different cultures and somewhat different languages. All of these that we've named here are Roman provinces. They're all controlled by Rome at this time. Then Luke mentions several provinces in Africa. He's switching now from the north and the east of Israel. He's now going to the south and the west, and he's moving westward as he names these. Egypt, and then to the west of Egypt lies Libya, and to the west of Libya lies Cyrene. And you may remember that it was Simon of Cyrene who was forced to carry Jesus' cross uh, as he was going to final execution on the cross. All of these are controlled by uh, Rome as well. They're all areas that Rome controls. So we haven't left the Roman Empire yet. Luke then shifted north across the Mediterranean. He mentions Italy. The ethnic Italians would have been included, but with Rome, we see people from all over. A lot of people came from all over the world to Rome, it being the center of the world at that time, so many people thought. And it's interesting that that Luke identifies some of these as Jews and some as converts. Well, now, a convert would be a Gentile, somebody who had gone through what was required to become a, a, a member of the Jewish faith, part of the Jewish culture. That's important. That's really important that we note that those converts were there, that they heard this, they being Gentiles, they're going to go back and communicate with other Gentiles, many of whom reside outside of the Roman Empire. So we're going to see a rapid spread of Christianity all across the Roman Empire, but more importantly, we're also going to see it spread outside of that empire. Luke included uh, Cretans and Arabs. Now, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean. Most of you are aware of that. The Arabs that he's talking about here were probably in uh, the area just to the immediate east of Israel. The culture that was known as the Nabataeans. Nabataeans. Now, I had a chance to visit that area a couple of years ago when I went to Israel, the Nabataeans were responsible for the creation of the culture that is found at Petra in Jordan. And it's, it's amazing the level of accomplishment of those individuals. They were extremely sophisticated builders, were financial geniuses, and uh, Rome could not conquer them. So they instead diverted the trade routes that were going through Nabataea around them and basically starved them out. There wasn't any way for them to support the culture they had without trade. So they had to 
close down what they were doing and move elsewhere. Very, very impressive list we see here of nations and peoples that were there, that were touched by the work of the Holy Spirit on this day, and multiple compass directions are represented in what we see. But in spite of all of that, that's not exhaustive. There were still others that Luke did not mention. He's not claiming to give us an exhaustive list. He's just telling us some of the main groups that were influenced by what was said there. In uh, each case, they're hearing the gospel. Very important. They're hearing the gospel, and they're hearing it in their own language. Wow, what a mighty God we serve. They're hearing it in their own language. So there's no misunderstanding, no problem of translation. And then in verses 12 and 13, we see two words introduced there, translated astounded and perplexed. They, people that were hearing this, were amazed. They were at a loss to explain what was happening, how it was happening, how they were able to hear and to understand what is going on. Others ask a very important question that we need to remember as we go forward. They're asking the question, what does this mean? What does this mean? They're, they're asking the all-important question of what does it mean that they're hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, they're hearing it in their own language, they're hearing it after having heard this powerful rushing wind, after seeing these tongues of fire. They're, they want to know, what does it mean? Well, they're going to get the answer to that question when Peter stands up and speaks, as we'll read about in our next group of verses. But we can't move on to those until we mention that there were detractors there, as there always are. There were those who said that they were drunk. They were drunk on new wine. Now, we could talk about what new wine is. That's not really important. The, what is important is that these mockers, these who refused to see and to understand what was going on, that they didn't immediately accept what was being said. They did not allow the Holy Spirit to change their hearts. I'm personally convinced that the reason that didn't happen was because they refused to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, just as some today will not allow the Spirit to work in their lives. There were some at that time. So these Apparently, it was a minority, not a very large group. These were skeptical. And when Peter stands up and speaks, as we're going to read about here in the next verses, he specifically addresses these skeptics and tells them uh, that what they're thinking makes absolutely no sense. So with that background... Let's go ahead and move into that next group of focal verses entitled Engaged, Acts 2, verses 14 through 16. Peter stood up in the eleven, or with the eleven, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now, Peter makes a very significant point here in, in the last words that we read here because he's talking to Jews, devout Jews, Jews that are here for this special holiday, and he's going to connect what's going on with Old Testament prophecy. We'll talk about that more here in just a second. So Peter, recognizing what was happening, took this extremely important moment, 
maybe the most important moment in all human history, to stand up and to proclaim what was going on. He's basically answering the question that we mentioned earlier that was asked, what does this mean by some of the people in the crowd? Well, he's answering that question, and he's doing it here. He is pointing out that something of all historical significance is happening at this very moment. And he proclaimed, he proclaimed, that's a, a word that is used quite often in the Old Testament for what the prophets did, and he says what he's talking about is extremely important. He makes that clear. Uh, basically, in today's lingo, what, <laughs> what Peter is saying is, Jews, listen up, listen up, pay attention to what I'm going to say. It's of earth-shakingly important notice. It will change your lives. He calls these people fellow Jews and fellow residents of Jerusalem. Well, technically, he's only a temporary resident of Jerusalem, but still a resident nonetheless. So, what does this mean? He is going to answer that question. In verse 15, Peter made it clear that the disciples were not drunk. He said it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. No, we're not drunk. We haven't even been drinking. What you're seeing is something far more powerful than the effects of alcohol. In verse 16, we see the fulfillment of what was spoken through the prophet Joel being mentioned. Well, in the intervening verses between these and what we close with here with our closing scripture, Peter tells them what is in Joel's prophecy. Not only does he tell them that, Joel 2, 28 through 32, if you want to read those verses, Psalms 16, 8 through 11, he also cites, or he quotes, he doesn't cite, and Psalms 110, verse 1, he also uh, uses as he explains to them, all we're doing is what the Old Testament prophesied was going to happen. We're fulfilling prophecy. And so this is going to really get the attention of these devout Jews. And as we see in following verses, the effect is substantial. So he points to Jesus being the fulfillment of Scripture, fulfillment of prophecy of the Scripture. And in doing that, he leads 3,000 individuals to make a decision for Christ. So Peter goes on to explain that everything that is happening here is fulfillment of Scripture, that Jesus was fulfillment of Scripture, and that they need to make a change in their lives. So we skip forward, jump over the intervening verses, which are mainly the Scripture that I have made reference to, the Old Testament Scripture, and we see in the last few verses under the heading of invited, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38, we read these verses. Therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Pent, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Wow. Remember, 50 days earlier, Peter was cowing in fear. He had denied Christ. He was very remorseful for what he had done. Now we see a very different Peter. What happened to Peter? What transformed him from the man who, using an earth, said, I don't know him, when asked about Jesus, to this man who boldly stands up, 
and proclaims that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture and willingly accepts any penalty that's going to come with him speaking so frankly and so boldly. Well, what has happened is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has transformed Peter, has transformed all of the disciples, the other 11 that we know, as well as numerous others that we don't know by name, and they become mighty warriors for Christ. So Peter stands up in very clear language, says you must recognize Jesus as Lord, as Messiah, and that he is resurrected. His resurrection proved who he is, and you must accept that truth. And then he goes on with a very important point. You must, you must repent. Ask for forgiveness of your sins. Now, when all of us are confronted with what Jesus has done for us, his death on the cross, we are normally cut to the quick. Read an account of the gospel being presented in a small village in India, and they were using, this is many years ago, <coughs> excuse me, they were using lantern slides to show pictures of what was taking place. And when the lantern slide came up of Jesus being crucified on the cross, one of the Indian men jumped up from his seat, ran up and grabbed the cloth and said, No, no, Jesus, you come down. I belong on the cross, not you. Well, that's what the clear revelation of Jesus in our lives, that's what happens to all of us. We realize we belong on that cross, not Jesus, that he died for us. So we need to give him everything that we are, everything we have, everything we will ever be. We owe it to him. And that's exactly what happened on this day of Pentecost. These listeners to Peter were cut to the quick, they asked, what must we do? And Peter told them in very precise language, you must repent, be baptized, you must receive forgiveness of your sins. If you do all of these things, then you too, you too will receive the Holy Spirit. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for for this clear presentation of the good news, the gospel of you, Lord. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for making it possible for me to have the Spirit living, residing within me, strengthening me, helping me to not do things I shouldn't do and to do things I should do. I pray for greater strengthening, Lord, for a better witness, a better testimony to you, Forgive me, O oh Lord, for all the times I have fumbled and failed and just messed up when you've given me opportunities to represent you, and I, I haven't done it, Lord. Please help me to be better about that. Father, those that are listening today, I pray that if there's anyone out there that hasn't repented, that hasn't invited you into their heart, that hasn't experienced the life-transforming power of your Spirit, Lord, that right now, at this moment, this will be the time. Father, I love you. I thank you so much for your love for me as demonstrated in what you've done for us through Christ. And it's in his name I ask these favors, O oh Lord, and give you the praise. Amen.